Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> Instead of a PowerPoint, which would be only a single slide, uh, do me a favor and just jot down on a piece of paper in front of you a famous quotation from Thomas Jefferson uh, from just after the Constitution was um, either while it was ratified or after it was ratified, uh, just after it was ratified. And that is the natural progress of things is for liberty to yield and government to gain ground. Okay, so that's kind of a, a theme for, for today's talk to just kind of occasionally look at and, and remind yourself of, of this observation or observation by Washington, by Jefferson. Okay, the natural progress of things is for liberty to yield and government to gain ground. Um, <clears throat> what I will suggest to you today is that the 14th Amendment has transformed the Constitution and recast it in its own image. Uh, we, we've made the 14th Amendment the heart of the Constitution, and in doing so, we've transformed the primary purpose of the Constitution. Okay, so it's a big claim, and um, you can tell me later if I've uh, lived up to it. Now, I'm hardly the first to notice this. A distinguished legal scholar at Columbia Law School by the name of George Fletcher referred to the Reconstruction Amendments, these are the post-Civil War Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Fletcher refers to them as the Second American Constitution because they created a new constitutional order whose principles are, and I'm quoting him here, are radically different from our original constitution. So of course, Fletcher could be wrong, uh, but my point, the, the reason I'm citing him or, or mentioning him is to clarify that he's not some loon. Okay? You're not crazy if you observe that the 14th Amendment represents a radical departure from Madison's constitution. So, uh, so I'll first explain the constitutional vision of Madison's constitution enacted in the wake of the American Revolution. Then I'll explain the constitutional vision of the 14th Amendment enacted in the wake of the Civil War. And then I'll demonstrate that we moderns in the 20th and 21st centuries have preferred the 14th Amendment's constitutional vision over Madison's vision. So in the last part of this talk, I'll document how we have actively and purposefully used the 14th Amendment to transform our constitution, to transform the, to transform Madison's constitution. So, uh, so let's start with, again, with the original constitution. And, and for that, we need to start with the revolution itself. So the biggest head scratcher that vexes my students about the American Revolution is why on earth would the George Washingtons and John Hancocks and Robert Morris's and, and, uh, and Thomas Jefferson's lead a revolution? Why would the richest and most powerful families in America, okay, the families that had prospered most and gained the most power and influence under the existing order, why would they want to change the, that existing order? Um, and the, the, the question is the right question, and it produces its own answer. Okay? When Americans rebelled in 1775 and 76, you know, when, when they launched this project, they did not see themselves as agents of change in changing the existing orders, uh, order. Rather, they saw themselves as agents of stability. They were resisting change and restoring the old imperial order. Okay. The revolutionists grew up in an empire that was governed by the principle of what was termed at the time uh, salutary neglect. It's basically, it, it's basically what we today call states' rights. Okay. So the, the traditional construction of the British Empire before the, the French and Indian War, before 
the, you know, 1755 to 63, uh, that, that traditional construction of the empire was one in which the central government in London did not involve itself directly in local governance in the colonies. Instead, local governments were, um, were the primary force in provincial governance. The British Empire was a loose confederation of self-governing colonies under a weak central government. And so, uh, like I said, um, at the time, Edmund Burke happened to be the one who coined this, this term, but it, it was, this arrangement was, uh, this constitutional structure was, uh, was, was termed uh, as, as a system of salutary or benign or beneficial neglect um, and, and this, this, this term was meant to convey the fact that, uh, it was meant to explain the economic and demographic miracle that had taken place in the colonies. Okay, and so Edmund Burke was making the observation that the colonies had grown and prospered so much because of the central government's uh, small footprint within the colonies. It's simply because it, as a free people, the British believed that self-government was not only politically and morally just, but also economically beneficial or salutary. Okay? Be because it allowed communities to pursue their economic interests freely. So the, the settlers approved of salutary neglect of this uh, Again, it's an anachronism, but the, the state's rights uh, structure of the empire. Okay, a system in which uh, local communities govern themselves rather than being governed by the central government. The settlers approved of salutary neglect. They complained and resisted when parliament threatened salutary neglect. They went to war to safeguard salutary neglect. And when they won, they recreated salutary neglect. They, create, they, they created a loose or recreated a loose confederation of self-governing states under a weak central government as outlined in the Articles of Confederation, the first American constitution. So in the decade preceding the revolution, advocates of the American cause indicated by their words in official remonstrances and petitions, along, uh, alongside unofficial complaints in the popular press, they complained by their words that their aim was to preserve Britain's old imperial order of strong local governments under a weak central government. And, uh, and after they won independence, they demonstrated with deeds that this indeed was their aim. They created a constitution in the Articles of Confederation that recreated that old order that they had clamored for, a loose confederation of self-governing states under a weak central government. Everything that, that the revolutionists had denied the British government before the war under the old imperial construction or constitution, they, they denied the United States government after the war under the first American constitution, including denying this central government the power to tax the states or their citizens. The, 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 the 13 state governments retained control over their finance, security, and diplomacy, paralleling those same functions in the United States government. government. So you can see how the Articles of Confederation preserve the old system of government that they had under the British Empire, rather than changing it. It was the British government that had tried to, to change, the, to, to centralize the empire's system of governance. Britain tried to end its long held habit of salutary neglect of having a, a weak central government, a, a small footprint. Whereas the colonists tried to preserve that 
long-held habit of self-government in the colonies. The, the American settlers attachment to local government and government by consent was not, uh, was not uniquely American. Uh, it, was, it was a commonly, it was a conventional English or British uh, political mindset. The intense fear of centralized, of centralized governance that sparked, that sparked American resistance in the 1760s had already produced two major rebellions in England in the 1640s and 1680s. And it produced two more rebellions in Scotland in the 17-teens and 1740s. What was common to all these, uh, these British rebellions was a conviction that centralized power invites abuse of power because it is arbitrary by its very nature. This British mentality, uh, which, which you see in the two English rebellions, the Scottish rebellions, and the American rebellion, uh, this, this British political mindset rested on the widespread assumption that people with power will abuse it. People with power will abuse it. Um, and and the, the insistence on government by consent was simply the, uh, the, the practical remedy to this very human problem, human nature. Everything that we associate with Anglo-American political culture flows from this understanding of human nature. Our, our political institutions, our, legis our legislative protocols, the arcane procedures in British and American legislatures, the attachment to local government and to local jury trials, procedures in courts of law, and, and the fear of concentrating power in one person or in one institution. All the provisions articulated in the English Bill of Rights, in the American state constitutions, in, in the Articles of Confederation, the Federal Constitution, the American Bill of Rights, these all were simply institutional solutions to the basic expectation that people with power will abuse it. Now, as, to, uh, as to why the British held this dark view of human nature, opinions differ, but, uh, but there's, there's reason to suspect that this mindset was uniquely British. And you can see this in, so um, Anglos constituted roughly 90% of the white population in the 13 colonies in, 17, in 1775. And these 90% overwhelmingly saw parliaments centralizing reforms in the 1760s and 70s as a threat to their own liberties. By contrast, German, Dutch, and Scandinavian settlers in, in British America had relatively little, relatively little zeal for the Patriot cause. And also, when, when American revolutionists tried to foment a rebellion in Canada in 1775, they targeted the French population there. You know, they expected the 70,000 French Canadians in, in, in Canada who were conquered people, conquered by the British only a few years earlier, um, they expected those French Canadians to be the most responsive to revolutionary propaganda regarding arbit uh, arbitrary power wielded by the imperial government. Yet the French were for the most part unresponsive. Instead, the Canadians who were most responsive, uh, receptive to revolutionary propaganda were the few thousand, uh, thousands of British settlers in Canada. Okay, so it, it seems to be a message or a mindset that, it, that spoke to British people, but not to these other, you know, again, German, Scandinavians, Dutch, French, et cetera. Um, And again, as to what made the British uh, develop this dark understanding of human nature, that's for another investigation. Um, 
But as a civilization that shared this dark philosophical and theological belief about human nature, Anglo-Americans were fearful of government officials because political power naturally and predictably produced abuse of power as they understood human nature. Um, and it's, it's in this philosophical context that Thomas Jefferson made his stoic observation that the natural progress of things is for liberty to yield and government to gain ground. Uh, again, the, um, the quotation I asked you to, to jot down. The, uh, and, and, and he wasn't the only one. James Monroe similarly noted that um, humanity had difficulties throughout history to preserve their dearest rights and best privileges um, as if they were impelled by an irresistible fate of despotism. And it's this bleak view of human history that explains Americans' vigilance and fearfulness regarding the, uh, the imperial reforms of the 1760s. Ever on the lookout for creeping advances of arbitrary power over the consent of the governed, they, they viewed with alarm parliamentary policies that strengthen the, strengthened the central government and weakened local communities' control over their governments and especially over their courts of law. And once they were independent, Americans approached the United States government with the same suspicion and vigilance. So with salutary, with salutary neglect as their constitutional guide, or by this point, we can start calling it states' rights because that's, that's the term Americans used after independence. Um, with that as their guide, they crafted a constitution that created an emasculated central government that was unable to impose its will on local communities. Um, when they were confronted in the 1780s by federalist efforts to replace the Articles of Confederation with a new constitution that promised to strengthen the central government and curtail local communities' ability to, abilities to govern themselves, it immediately triggered those pre-revolutionary fears and suspicions among Americans. The, the debates and contests between Federalists and, and Anti-Federalists resuscitated pre-war fears about centralized power and arbitrary powers, uh, centralized government and arbitrary power. Now, what's particularly interesting about the, these debates between Federalists and Anti-Federalists, you know, and the, 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 the arguments in um, both in the federal constitution and the federal convention, but especially in the ratification contest after, um, is that usually disagree. You know, again, so when you look at the debates and arguments over the federal Const over the proposed federal constitution, you'd expect that the disagreements. Well, I'll say it this way: in most cases, when you see such conflicts. Such, such uh, arguments, uh, it's because disagreements on policy preferences usually pit two, two sides that differ with one another philosophically or ideologically. Okay, so the, the reason that the sides disagree on policy is that they differ in their worldviews, but not so with the, with the federal constitution. You know, the ratification debates between Federalists and, and Anti-Federalists were odd in that they pitted two sides that did not disagree philosophically. Federalists and Anti-Federalists shared that negative uh, view of human nature. Both sides believed that people with power will abuse it. Both sides were convinced that governments were necessary to preserve law, order, justice, but also extremely dangerous, given that the powers of government are wielded by humans, 
uh, governments virtually guarantee abuses of power, arbitrary government, lawlessness, and tyranny. James Madison explained that the essence of government is power, and power, because it must be lodged in human hands, will always be liable to abuse. Similarly, if you, know, you might remember um, that in George Washington's farewell address, he warned that occupants of public offices love power and are prone to abuse it. When he was doing so, he was not suggesting that the people who are drawn to government, people like himself, uh, are, are power hungry knaves. Rather, he expressed a widely held Anglo-American understanding that all people, good and bad, uh, are, are prone to abuse power when they acquire power. It's not that people in government are uniquely bad, they're just people. But power leads them towards abuse of power because they're human. Um, so, so both sides agreed on this, Federalists and Anti-Federalists. Anti-Federalists saw this as a problem that cannot be solved. Okay, so we need governments, but governments are populated by people. And so we will face abuse, uh, abuse of power from these people who hold government power. And because of that, because abuse of power is inevitable, you know, because you know, because corruption and abuse in high places cannot be prevented, the most any society can do is to do away with the high places. Okay, so, you, so instead of having um, a lot of abuse, we'll just have a little bit, we'll have small doses of abuse rather than strong doses of abuse. Um, so the anti-federalists, like the, just like the revolutionists of 1776, the anti-federalists accepted that governmental abuse was an inescapable fact of life. And therefore, they preferred to endure small local abuses from small local governments than endure great abuses from a powerful central government. By contrast, federalists tried to find a clever solution to the problem of human nature. Madison's formulation of a central government splintered into separate branches and limited strictly to a set of enumerated powers was his plan to, to, to cheat history. Federalists believe that the federal government's internal divisions against itself would, would pit competing interest groups within the government against one another, again, within the, because of the splintered structure of the federal government that they drew up on the, in, the, in the Constitution. Okay, and this would, uh, would counteract the gradual and natural concentration of power that had characterized all previous governments in all of human history both monarchical and Republican. Okay, so this separation of powers within the government itself, between legislative, executive, and judicial branches of, of the federal government, and between the two houses of Congress, this, again, the separation of powers between all these different elements was going to act as an internal structural guard, uh, guardrail against the consolidation of power in the central government because it'll be divided against itself. And on, and on top of this, this internal structural guardrail was buttressed by an external, although theoretical guardrail, uh, which was the Federalists' insistence that the new central government would be limited, restricted by law, courts, by local governments and by public opinion to exercising only certain enumerated powers and no others. 
underlined twice. Okay, so the uh, the 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 this external guardrail against the concentration of power was this idea of enumerated powers. The the theory of, of um, the, 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 this is a, a limited government of enumerated powers, meaning that the federal government would have only those enumerated powers that were explicitly granted to it in the Constitution and no others. Now, the, the ratification contest revealed that, Ameri that the American people were more skeptical than Madison. They didn't buy this. They didn't think that this was enough. Okay, the, this internal struct, uh, guardrail of a splintered government internally and the doctrine of enumerated powers uh, as an external guardrail, uh, they, they, they were not convinced. They weren't buying it. And so to draw support away from, from the anti-federalists, federalists, federalists agreed to add to the constitution explicit prohibitions in the form of a Bill of Rights as a third guardrail. And these, these 10 amendments to the Constitution overtly barred the federal government from taking certain actions. So the, the, the Bill of Rights therefore uh, in, in this way reflects the fears of 18th century Americans that future federal legislature uh, late, future federal legislators and executives and judges might not be mindful of Madison's safeguards. They feared that the separation of power uh, of powers and the doctrine of enumerated powers were insufficient to interrupt what Jefferson called the natural progress of things. In this respect, the, the, the American Bill of Rights is an anti-federalist document. If, if the Articles of Confederation reflected the fears and complaints of America, uh, that Americans had before 1776, and the federal constitution reflected the, or reflects the anxieties federalists had in the 1780s, then the Bill of Rights reflects the anxieties that anti-federalists had in 1787 and 88. Anti-federalists warned that the new powerful central government could in time threaten self-government in the states and wield arbitrary power just as parliament had done in the 1760s and 70s. And so the Bill of Rights addressed these anti-federalist fears one by one. To those who feared the central government might establish a national church, regulate speech, or break up public gatherings, the Bill of Rights offered the First Amendment. To those who feared the new government might restrict Americans' ability to possess firearms, it offered the Second Amendment. To those who feared that the central government might do away with jury trials, it offered the Fifth, Sixth, and Seventh Amendments, and so on and so forth. Now, Federalists did not have serious reservations about the prohibitions against federal activism listed in the Bill of Rights. Um, and this is because the, these, Federalists, these Federalist framers of the Constitution, just like the anti, their anti-Federalist opponents, were also, you know, the Federalists were also afraid of centralized power. They never envisioned a central government that would reach into the states and govern them directly. What they imagined was a large country characterized by regional pluralism in which localities with different circumstances, interests, and cultures produced different governmental systems and different arrangements. Uh, in, in fact, or indeed, Federalists feared in the 1780s, just like in the 1760s, they feared a consolidated government over this diverse place called America, or now the United States of America. 
over the diverse regions and communities that formed the United States of America. Seeing government coercion as a necessary evil, federalists wished to resort to centralized power only as a last resort. You know, believing that, that believing that local governments are more consensual, more accountable, and less powerful than central governments, they wanted governance to be primarily local. And because of that, the federal constitution preserved tremendous autonomy for states and localities to govern themselves and shape different policies on religious worship, official state churches, slavery, freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, guns, criminal procedures, name it. States could do what they wished on all these fronts under the Articles, uh, under the Articles of the Confederation. And this remained the case under the, Constitution, under the new federal constitution and the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights simply reinforced this pluralism through explicit and absolute prohibitions against federal interference in these various realms. Even a casual reading of the Bill of Rights reveals that it does not guarantee to Americans the various rights and freedoms it discusses. It does not say that you can speak freely or worship freely or bear arms or be safe from arbitrary arrest. All it does is deny this newly established federal government the powers that were widely understood to belong to the local governments. The power to tell you what you can and cannot say, the power to establish an official church, the power to outlaw certain religious practices, the power to outlaw certain, uh, certain guns. Um, the language of the Bill of Rights is absolutist on religion and speech and guns and assembly, et cetera, et cetera, not because 18th century Americans were absolutists on this issue, on these issues. They were not. The authors of the Constitution and of the Bill of Rights believed that people's various liberties, such as speech, assembly, religious worship, gun ownership, et cetera, can and should be curtailed by their governments in various ways. They insisted, however, that the central government have no role in such curtailments. It was universally understood that the, that the prohibitions in the Bill of Rights applied exclusively to the federal government. The citizens of the various states therefore remained as free as they had been under the Articles of Confederation and under, the, under Britain's old imperial construction to restrict, to restrict speech, establish an official church, outlaw certain religious practices, enact gun control measures, and determine their own criminal court procedures. And you can see this when you look at the situation of uh, at, uh, at established churches. Some states had an established church well into the 19th century. It was not unconstitu unconstitutional. And when those state churches were eventually dismantled, it was done not by the authority of the Bill of Rights, but by the citizens of those states voluntarily and democratically. Okay. The, the absolutist prohibitions in the Bill of Rights are not evidence that Americans were, uh, you know, were, were absolutists on those issues that they were libertarians. The absolutist prohibitions in the Bill of Rights are evidence that Americans were absolutists about barring the federal government and the federal government alone from acting on all these various local matters. And this is why citizens and non-citizens alike enjoyed the same protections under the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights doesn't list the people or categories of people who have the right to speak freely, bear arms, assemble freely, worship freely. It only lists the one government, the federal government, that was prohibited from restricting these activities. 
um, so that's that's the construction and the ideological philosophical mindset behind the the federal constitution. Um, now, when you move to the to how this federal constitution changed in the 19th century, especially after the uh, Civil War, uh, it's 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 a process. The the notion that the Bill of Rights instructs local governments on what they can and cannot do with regard to speech, religion, guns, juries, and you know, court procedures like reading you, uh, insisting that your local police read you your Miranda rights when you get arrested. That idea is a 20th century novelty. Okay, the, the, the idea that the Bill of Rights tells your local municipality what it can and cannot do with regard to speech, guns, et cetera, uh, assembly, religion, that's a 20th century novelty. Okay? That's how we live today. Uh, that's how we read the constitution, but it was not how people, the people who wrote the constitution wrote it and understood it. And it's not how Americans read the constitution throughout the 19th century. So in the 20th century, we, um, we developed, invented a new way to understand the constitution, a new way to apply it to our daily lives. And this, this, innovative, this innovation in constitutional jurisprudence has been pivotal in the transformation of the United States from a federated republic in which local communities govern themselves into a modern managerial nation state that is governed from the center. And the key to this transformation was the 14th Amendment enacted in the aftermath of the Civil War. Now, the 14th Amendment was a product of unique post-war circumstances, and it was ratified with the purpose of empowering the federal government to reconstruct the defeated South. That is to reshape political institutions, uh, political practices and political culture in the Southern states as they prepared to re-enter the Union. Kind of like how the US wanted to reconstruct Germany and Japan as liberal democracies after World War II. We thought that if, if we reshaped Germany and Japan to be democratic like we are, then they won't start another world war. Uh, and so the, the same mindset uh, go governed the actions of, uh, of, of the United States government of the North after the Civil War. The Northern states wanted to prevent further tensions between North and South by remaking the South in their own image. Thus, unlike the 10 amendments that comprise the Bill of Rights, the 14th amendment did not contain prohibitions against the federal government, but prohibitions against state governments. In the context of the multitude of liberated slaves in the South, the 14th amendment did the following three things. First, it established the federal government as the arbiter of citizenship in the United States. Second, it conferred citizenship on the freed slaves. And third, uh, it prohibited states from curtailing the rights and privileges, meaning the liberties, of US citizens without due process of law, of, of, of the law or denying any of their residents the equal protection of the laws. Um, now, if, if, if you uh, pay attention even, uh, even loosely, uh, you'll notice an inherent clash between the pre-Civil War Constitution and the 14th Amendment. And that is that the Constitution provides the structure for limited government by constraining 
federal authority and power. The Constitution restricts the federal government. It, it provides, again, all those guardrails that I talked about earlier. So you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. So my dog's here. Um, and and to, to buttress these restrictions, the Bill of Rights provides explicit limitations on federal power. The 14th Amendment, by contrast, provides the structure for the opposite type of government. It empowers the central government to act within local jurisdictions on a vast spectrum of issues ranging from the most public, like elections, policing, criminal law, public education, to the most private, like commerce, religion, housing, medicine, home defense, marriage, family life, nutrition, sports, civic associations. Whereas the pre-Civil War constitutional amendments envisioned the states as the defenders of the people against federal encroachment and abuse, the 14th Amendment did the opposite. Not only did it, did it identify the state governments as the potential threats to the citizenry, and again, remember that the framers of the 14th Amendment had the South's new black citizens in mind. Okay, so not only did the 14th Amendment identify the state governments as potential threats to the citizenry, uh, it empowered the federal government to monitor, curtail, and correct abusive or predatory conduct by local governments. The Northerners who won that, who, who won that war at such a high cost needed these former slaves to become active and effective citizens of the Southern states for those states to be again, reconstructed the way the North wanted them. So if the pre-Civil War Constitution and Bill, of, and Bill of Rights limited federal power and jurisdiction within the states, the 14th Amendment created new jurisdictions and new powers for the federal government in the states. So it's no surprise that when, when you trace the process by which the federal government had extended its authority and, and reach into the localities in the 20th and, 20th and, and 21st centuries, you will find that most of the centralizing reforms have been accomplished through reference to and reliance on and application of the 14th Amendment. The, the post-Civil War Constitution was, was, in this way, a house divided against itself. And as Abraham Lincoln, as you probably remember, uh, as Abraham Lincoln pointed out on another matter altogether, a house divided itself, uh, divided against itself cannot stand. It must become all one thing or all the other. And indeed, in the century and a half that followed the Civil War, the 14th Amendment established itself at the heart of the Constitution and remade the Constitution in its own image. And this transformation took place in the early 20th century when federal courts began citing the 14th Amendment, specifically its due process and equal protection clause, clauses. Um, so the federal courts began citing the 14th Amendment to incorporate that is to apply the Bill of Rights on, uh, apply it to states, uh, uh, state and municipal governments. So whereas until then, it was universally understood that the Bill of Rights restricted the federal government alone, the courts used the incorporation doctrine to apply the prohibitions of the Bill of Rights also to state governments and local governments. And by the late 20th century, the incorporation doctrine had become, had become a firmly entrenched orthodoxy in American legal and political culture. 
it placed the federal government, federal courts first and foremost, as the guarantors of, or guarantor of civil rights in every local jurisdiction in America. So the, in, in, in this way, the incorporation doctrine uh, invited the federal government to supervise, police, and correct local governments in matters that had long been understood as purely local and beyond the jurisdiction of the central government. So incorporation allowed the 14th Amendment to create the kind of strong central government that Madison's constitution had explicitly aimed to prevent. A central government that's empowered to govern the states and towns of America. The incorporation doctrine has even turned the Bill of Rights on its head, transforming it from a document that plainly and explicitly prohibited the federal government from acting in any way in many realms of American life. Again, religion, speech, guns, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, turn it from, from this kind of document that explicitly prohibited federal, uh, the federal government from acting in any way in all these realms of American life into a document that not only allows the federal government to act in these realms, but in fact compels it to act. It compels the federal government to protect you if you're, or to, to intervene on your behalf if your local government punishes you for speaking or establishes an official church or takes your guns or searches your trunk without a warrant, et cetera. Um, so for our purposes here today, the incorporation doctrine itself is the ultimate proof that uh, the Professor Fletcher and I are not alone in noticing the clash between uh, the first and second constitution, okay? between, the, um, between Madison's constitution and the 14th Amendment. The many jurists who invented the incorporation doctrine and the multitudes of jurists who have embraced and expanded it since then, since early 20th century, all of them sensed the same contradiction be be between these two entities, between Madison's Constitution and the 14th Amendment. They understood that to follow the 14th Amendment, they needed some mechanism to hurdle the Constitution's obstacles against federal power. That is why they developed this incorporation doctrine. It's a way to get around the restrictions of the Bill of Rights, the restrictions of uh, the enumerated uh, powers doctrine. If the, if, if the 14th Amendment could live in harmony with Madison's constitution, there'd be no need to invent the incorporation doctrine. The incorporation doctrine harmonizes between two competing constitutional visions by ordaining that the 14th Amendment's vision shall govern and Madison's vision shall yield. This, this development of granting the central, the, the central government powers that the constitution did not give it started long before the Civil War and before the 14th Amendment. In fact, it started as soon as the ink dried on the pages of the Bill of Rights. So the, the incorporation doctrine should be seen in the context of a federal government that was slowly, incrementally, but consistently gathering more powers and greater jurisdictions within the states and over the states in the 70 years that preceded the Civil War. The incorporation doctrine was simply the, 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 most, uh, the, the, the most explicit and boldest method that Americans have devised over the centuries to liberate their national government from the straitjacket imposed on it by the framers of the federal constitution and the Bill of Rights. Okay. 
So Madison's constitution featured two uh, what's called parchment barriers against the growth of federal power. Okay, parchment barriers means uh, that there were simply words scribbled on parchment, on the parchment of the constitution, of that document. Okay, so, so two, two written prohibitions or uh, written barriers on uh, the, the, the growth of federal power. The first of Madison's parchment barriers was the doctrine of enumerated powers, which is articulated explicitly in the Constitution's Article I, Section 8, and again in the Ninth and Tenth Amendments of the Bill of Rights. This doctrine of, of enumerated powers stated that the federal government was authorized to perform only a limited set of tasks that were plainly listed, enumerated, itemized, in the pages of the federal constitution. That's the first parchment barrier. The second parchment barrier was the remainder of the Bill of Rights, the amendments one through eight. And even before the ink on the Bill of Rights was dry, both of these obstacles were overcome by creative reading of the constitution. When, when Thomas Jefferson and James Madison cited the doctrine of enumerated powers and the Ninth and Tenth Amendments to oppose Alexander Hamilton's bank bill in 1791, again, this is right as the Bill of Rights was being ratified and incorporated into the Constitution. Um, so when, when Jefferson and Madison were citing enumerated powers and the Ninth and Tenth Amendments to oppose the bank bill, Hamilton countered that the Constitution's necessary and proper clause actually granted Congress implied powers beyond the explicit powers enumerated in the Constitution. And both Congress and, and President Washington sided with Hamilton on this. You know, they, they, they affirmed Hamilton's expansive reading of the Constitution. And then years later in McCall versus Maryland, the Supreme Court uh, gave its stamp of approval to, to Hamilton's more expansive uh, kind of loosey goosey reading of the constitution. So the, so the story of the bank bill offers a glimpse to the future course or, or a guide to the future course of American constitutional history. It reveals to historians, as it did to Jefferson and Madison at the time, that the parchment barriers and backstops in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights were too weak to counteract the natural progress of things. That, again, that, that you jotted down at the beginning of this talk. And in the decades that followed, federal officials and judges continued to find additional implied powers, not only in the Constitution's necessary and proper clause, but also in its commerce clause and the general welfare clause. In this way, the federal government's field of jurisdiction expanded gradually, but progressively, even before the 14th Amendment. But this incremental and slow process went into overdrive when the 14th Amendment and the incorporation doctrine completely transformed the national government into a government of innumerable powers and responsibilities. So Madison's most effective and lasting barrier against federal activism in, in American life was not the Bill of Rights therefore, and, and definitely not the doctrine of enumerated powers. Okay? The Bill of Rights was always just a piece of paper, again, a parchment barrier. Madison's most effective and lasting barrier against federal activism in, in the localities where we, we, we all live has always been the structure of the federal government itself. Future generations of Americans could choose their own path when confronting the Constitution's parchment barriers. 
They could apply those prohibitions uh, selectively or universally, interpret them loosely or strictly, understand them figuratively or literally, ignore them altogether or revise them with new constitutional amendments. But these future generations had no choice but to occupy the federal institutions of government bequeathed to them by the framers. And by creating wholly separate branches of government, Congress, president, courts, uh, and by splitting Congress into two separate legislatures, the founders hoped to compel future generations to uh, to, uh, to 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 observe their their or, or to live by their strictures that that prohibited or, or, or fought against the concentration of power. These, these built-in fractures within the central government were meant to create competing powers within the government with different institutions checking and obstructing other institutions, factions. And the idea was that the byproduct of such a divided and internally conflicted government was liberty for the citizenry. Okay, so if the government is stymied, if the central government, which again, both sides, Federalists and Anti-Federalists, feared might become abusive if, if it gathers more power, if this central government was stymied and, and, and slowed down by all these internal divisions and, and internal fighting between the two houses of Congress and between the executive and the judiciary and the uh, legislatures, et cetera, et cetera, um, then the government would be prevented from acting because it's so internally conflicted. And the result, the, 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 um, the byproduct of that internal uh, dysfunction, Again, it's not a dysfunction, that's the design function, but the uh, internal conflicts would be inaction. And, and the result of that would be liberty for the citizenry, for, for the localities. Um, however, even on this front, so e even though that barrier, you know, the one non parchment barrier has been successful at um, relatively su more successful than the parchment barriers at, at preventing or slowing down the growth of federal power. But even there, Americans have proved too ingenious for the founders, for, you know, for Madison and, and, and the others. Um, so while the federal government still features all those internal structural divisions that the founders instituted in 1787, Americans uh, have coalesced around political parties whose function it is to paper over and mitigate these institutional divisions between House and Senate and White House and federal court, et cetera. So when these four institutions, again, two houses of Congress, the White House and the courts, when these four institutions are controlled by the same party, then the party in power is able to get these different institutions to work together quite harmoniously, like a team. It's something that Madison's constitution aimed to prevent, was designed to prevent. The purpose of a written constitution is to compel future generations to live by rules set for them by a previous generation. Now, given that Americans have the world's oldest written constitution that is still in use, um, it's understandable that Americans have chafed under the restrictions imposed on them by a generation of Americans long dead 
uh, now the, the count, the, the, this country's founding generation was animated by a conviction that people with power will abuse it. And this was the underlying belief at the heart of English political culture in the early modern era. And it, it manifested itself in the great events of that era, in the English Civil War, the Glorious Revolution, the Jacobite rebellions, uh, and the American Revolution. And it manifested itself in the way that English communities govern themselves daily in their localities, in the way they insisted on juries in criminal trials, uh, the, the way they ran their churches, the municipalities, et cetera, their, their, their civic organizations. So, so this conviction about human nature shaped the rules and procedures Anglo-Americans instituted, uh, instituted in their courts of law, churches, and local and central governments. So the, 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 frame, the, the framers of the US Constitution were trying to prevent the concentration of governmental power in the central government that they were creating there at the Philadelphia Convention in 17, 1787. They believed that the greater the power, the more dangerous the abuse. So they were not seeking to remove roadblocks and impediments from the path of the powerful national government that they created. Quite the contrary. Like the framers of the English Bill of Rights, the framers of the US Constitution designed a system in which local communities governed themselves and were shielded from the central government. They feared the central government, just like the anti-federalists did. So when anti-federalists anti warned that the new federal government would stretch and break the constitutional boundaries created for it in the 1787 constitution, the framers agreed to add a bill of rights to the constitution as a, as a third bulwark, a third guardrail against such federal aggrandizement. But just as the American founding generation gave political form to its philosophical and theological convictions about human nature in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, modern Americans have given political form to their own political and philosophical beliefs and theological beliefs with the 14th Amendment, the incorporation doctrine, and the doctrine of a living Constitution. The, these three new elements, 14th Amendment, Incorporation Doctrine, and the Living Constitution, um, these three reflect a sea change in the way Americans view their national government. Americans have learned over the course of the later 19th century and the 20th century to, uh, or, or maybe even earlier in the 19th century, okay, so forget later. Uh, in, in the 19th and 20th centuries, Americans learned to trust the federal government, to identify with the federal government, to bond with it emotionally, look to it for moral and political leadership, and expect numerous services and protections from it. And this explains Americans' frustration with life under an 18th century constitution animated by distrust and fear of central governance. This, this change in how Americans view the national government explains their continual efforts in the 19th and especially the 20th centuries, um, their continual efforts to liberate their national government from the constitutional constraints placed on it by Madison and his colleagues. Um, now, I'd, I'd bet that the founders would have been actually pleasantly surprised that their, con the, that their construction of limited government survived the citizens' impulses for as long as it did. Roughly a full century, you know, from 1789 to roughly 1900, when, when the incorporation doctrine was kind of forming. Um, 
So I, I think they'd actually be impressed that this experiment in limited government uh, lasted for, for as long as it did. Because after all, the failure of the constitution to prevent the concentration of power in the central government was not only predictable, it was in fact predicted as the natural progress of things right at the time, right as the constitution was being written. Thank you. Um, now I see here that got some questions in the chat. Okay, so um, so the first question is to to explain um, what I mean by the Fourteenth Amendment and in, in Corporation Doctrine turning the Bill of Rights on its head. So the the Fourteenth Amendment and Incorporation Doctrine obligate federal authorities to supervise and correct and punish local governments for, for, for violating uh, items on the Bill of Rights, something that, uh, that the federal government was prohibited from doing by the Constitution and explicitly prohibited by the, by the Bill of Rights. So again, the, 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 frame of, the framers of the Constitution, they, they, they were not libertarians. Okay? They were not anarchists. They understood that some level of, someone, some level of government must be there to outlaw yelling fire in a crowded theater outlaw child pornography, outlaw the ownership of certain guns and bombs, et cetera, et cetera, outlaw human sacrifice in your, in your church, okay? Um, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights reserved that power, you know, to outlaw this, outlaw that, outlaw that, reserved that power solely to local governments. And if that wasn't clear, you know, if, if it wasn't clear that the Constitution, because of the enumerated powers, et cetera, et cetera, uh, left all that governing to be done by local governments, then the Bill of Rights made that explicit. It says the federal government is not allowed to pass any laws uh, restricting uh, speech or assembly or this or that or guns or is not allowed to establish a church, etc. Et okay. um, the Fourteenth Amendment and the Incorporation Doctrine do the opposite. You know, they prohibit the locals, you know, um, and and and, um, and and they carve. And carve out exemptions for the federal uh, for the federal government from the explicit prohibitions in the Bill of Rights. Okay, so th those those prohibitions in the Bill of Rights were written explicitly against the federal government, prohibiting the federal government from acting on again speech, assembly, guns, church, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They were not written to prohibit your local governments from doing whatever it wanted. Okay, but the 14th Amendment and the way it's in, understood by the, the, the combination of the 14th Amendment and the incorporation doctrine wind up giving the federal government power to act exactly in those realms that the Bill of Rights prohibits it from, from, prohibits it from acting. So after the incorporation doctrine became the way we read the constitution, the federal government, you know, all three branches, passed laws and rulings outlawing certain kinds of pornography, certain kinds of political speech, um, you know, uh, um, well, for, for example, well, I, I won't get into that, but certain kinds of political speech are outlawed by federal statute or federal, federal uh, rulings. Uh, campaign financing, for example, is one just one example. Um, the federal government 
has outlawed certain kinds of uh, incendiary speech, outlawed buying certain kinds of guns, outlawed uh, taking your gun to certain places, uh, outlawed practicing certain forms of religious worship. Okay. Can anyone find authorization for these federal actions in the Bill of Rights? It's not even a question, no. Okay. The only place you'll find authorization for the federal government to pass laws and regulations in, in, in these realms is in court rulings or in congressional law, but you will not find it in the constitution and you will not find it, definitely not find it in the Bill of Rights. In fact, you'll find explicit prohibitions against all of them in the Bill of Rights. Okay, so in that respect, the 14th Amendment and incorporation doctrine have turned the Bill of Rights on its, on its head. They compel the federal government to do things that the Bill of Rights um, prohibits it from doing. Okay, so the, 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 goal of seven, the, the goal in 1776 and in 1787 was to found a republic of limited government. Okay? Either, either forcing the British government to return to salutary neglect or to establish a new, uh, a, a new entity called the United States of America, which will be governed by that same salutary neglect structure, states' rights. Okay. Um, now, wh whatever merits and virtues the 14th Amendment has, limiting the power of the central government is not one of them. Okay. This is exactly why we moderns love the 14th Amendment so much and use it so often to empower the federal judiciary, federal legislature, and federal executive to do various things that we, that, that we want them to do for us. Okay, so for example, the, the, the most famous applications of the 14th Amendment, if you look at them, instead of convincing Southerners in the 1950s and 60s to desegregate, we simply use the 14th Amendment to force them to do so. Instead of convincing Americans to legalize abortion or, or gay rights, or I'm sorry, gay marriage, um, we simply use the 14th Amendment to force them to, 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 to do that. So the, we have 330 million Americans. We won't all agree if these developments are uh, positive or negative. But we can all agree that these policies were enforced on American citizens by their central government, rather than being voted into existence by the, by, uh, by the citizens. And, and the most permissive tool in the federal government uh, toolbox to force its policy preferences on, on Americans is the 14th Amendment. Um, second question. Uh, <laughs> that's good. This is exactly what I was I said. We won't all agree if, the, if this is a good thing or a bad thing. Um, so the second question is, uh, is it a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, you know, did, the question is whether I, um, if I'm against the 14th Amendment or wish it hadn't been enacted. Uh, so look, you're, <clears throat> you're asking me a political question and I certainly have my political opinions, but so does every, every American who follows politics. You know, a, a historian is no more qualified than a banker or a plumber or a musician to tell you whether limited government is a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, and whether local governance is wiser or more just than central governance. Okay, so you don't need a historian for that. Um, I, had a, I had a colleague who was once, uh, a, um, well, regardless of, of, of his background, but um, so he was at the other end of the political spectrum than, than I am, but we both agreed on this point that the 14th Amendment transformed the Constitution and the United States. Okay, so 
one of us celebrated while the other one uh, lamented. So, uh, so I'd rather talk about the history of the United States and let you make of it what you will in terms of your politics. Um, you know, we, we, can, we can discuss politics, uh, but, but as a political pundit, I have no more uh, authority or wisdom than anyone else in, in the room. Well, I'm alone in this room, but anywhere else, anyone else in this forum. Um, so I think I'm more useful to you as a historian than a political commentator. What I'm, what I'm telling you is that the reason we've been chafing against Madison's constitution and transforming it and turning it upside down is that we've developed a new understanding of human nature and therefore a new attitude towards human governments. Right? When, when they believed that people with power will abuse it, they supported localism. They launched a war of independence to protect localism. And they wrote two constitutions designed explicitly to protect localism. When Americans in the 19th, 20th centuries, uh, when Americans developed a more positive view of human nature, again, in the modern era, definitely in the 20th century, I suspect that it's a 19th century development. Um, so let me finish the sentence. When Americans developed a more uh, positive understanding of human nature, they became more more hopeful, more positive about central governance, more trusting and less fearful of the central government. And, uh, and because of that, they started clashing with that limited government constitution that the revolutionary generation had designed for them. Um, also, so, so that's a historical development, okay, that those Americans had a certain understanding of human nature and therefore a strong fear of central governance. We have a different understanding of human nature and therefore a different attitude, but we're living in their constitution and that creates this uh, chafing. Also, um, regardless of where you stand politically on limited government, we all should remember that although the 14th Amendment was an effective, was and still is an effective constitutional tool to centralize the US and, um, and build power in the national government, this process of centralization was taking place well before the Civil War and the passage of the 14th Amendment. Like I say, like I said, the, the ink wasn't dry yet on the 10th Amendment when it was undercut by Hamilton's bank bill. Moreover, administrative centralization in the 20th century um, utilized not only the 14th Amendment, but also the general welfare clause of the Constitution and, uh, and the Commerce Clause, et cetera. Um, and also just pure majoritarian politics without any constitutional justifications whatsoever. So, uh, so what transformed this country from a limited government to a managerial nation state was not the 14th Amendment itself or the incorporation doctrine itself, uh, but rather, um, you know, I, I remember a few years ago, um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg pointed out in some interview that, again, that, that the 14th Amendment, the 10th Amendment, the uh, First Amendment, these are just words on a parchment. Okay? What gives meaning and force to those words are the beliefs of the people. Um, it's, it's the citizen's view of the United States that changed first. The law schools and the courts followed after that. Okay, so in, in the 19th century, Americans increasingly demanded Washington solutions to concerns that in the past had been understood as local. 
Okay, so weighty concerns like slavery and racial discrimination and poor relief to less weighty uh, things like injuries at football games. If you remember Teddy Roosevelt getting involved in that. Um, your family's diet, pollution, wages, et cetera. Okay. So, so they passed new laws to do all these things, you know, to, to fix all these problems that, that Americans identified and asked Washington to fix for them. Um, so Americans, through their representatives, passed laws in Washington to deal with these things, and they interpreted the supreme law of the land in ways that would allow these laws to stand as constitutional. Okay, so I, I, I don't know what would have happened in an alternate reality, one without the 14th Amendment, but I suspect that these people and these institutions would still have acted to transform the United States into the kind of country that, that they approved of. Okay. What I do know is that in our historical reality, these people identified the 14th Amendment as a particularly, uh, a particularly effective tool to realize their vision of a centralized uh, welfare state, which Madison's constitution precluded. Okay. So I'm not uh, denigrating the 14th Amendment by saying that it changed what the, federal con uh, what, what the federal convention produced in 1787. You know, we, we know, we, you know, we all agree you know, from the extreme left to the extreme right, I, th I think uh, we can all agree that Madison would be stunned to learn what we, for the past hundred years or so, have believed to be constitutional. Okay, this is not a controversial claim, but a widely acknowledged statement of fact. And we have Madison on record explaining that much of what the federal government does today is prohibited by the Constitution as he understood it. Okay, my point is not to celebrate it or or or, or to to celebrate or lament how we've transformed Madison's limited government constitution. My point is to tell you that it happened, okay, and that should not be controversial. Um, what might be controversial is my explanation for why it happened. Okay, I, I believe that we have developed different beliefs about human nature. Okay, that they, in the 18th century, thought people with power will abuse it, and therefore they favored limited government. We do not believe that. And therefore, we want to give the central government more power and to expand its role in our daily life daily lives. Uh, okay, we have here a question. Uh, why did the Federalist movement emerge so soon after uh, a states' rights revolution? You know, why, why did the um, Articles of Confederation last for such a short time? Um, so uh, let me... Let me answer that in two different ways. Um, the first, I'll answer the way that my opponents would, would answer. The, the, the other camp would say that the quick dumping of the Articles of Confederation in favor of a stronger, more collective, uh, more centralized uh, government uh, tells us that the, article, that the Articles of Confederation did not reflect the revolutionists' political values and the revolution's political ends. Instead, the articles were merely a wartime stopgap, a placeholder, and as soon as the war was over, they went about finishing the job. Uh, so in, in this view, the 1787 Constitution is the end point of the revolution and reflects the desired outcome of the 1776 revolutionists. Okay, the, 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 they would say that the revolutionists envisioned a nation state for themselves. Uh, they wanted a sovereign state rather than 13 separate sovereign states. Um, and they, they wanted a national common government with exclusive powers. My own explanation 
uh, for the quick change from the first to the second constitution is that in the 1776 to 1781 period, Americans did not expect the US government to govern them. But by 1787, increasing numbers did. It was still a very close call, you know, ratification squeaked through. But there were enough Americans who had elevated their expectations of what the American government should do for them. So in this formulation, the 1787 constitution was not the end point of the revolution. It was not part of the revolution because it did not reflect the desired outcome of the 1776 revolution. The, revolu the revolutionists envisioned 13 sovereign states, not a nation state. And they did not want a common government to govern them. They left the governing to their local and state governments. Um, and and you, you can look at Chase Rebellion as a, as, as a note you know, to, to, to illustrate this, but we won't go into to this now. So the, uh, the debate between the two camps is when Americans developed a sense of nationhood, you know, this common identity, a familial bond, and um, uh, a, a mutual responsibility to support and come to the aid of fellow Americans. Uh, one camp sees the American sees an American identity and national bonds forming well before the revolution and producing the revolution, and the other camp holds that Americans developed a sense of nationhood only during the war and after the war, and that this American sense of nationhood, American identity, this common bond, etc., was a product of the harsh experience of the war rather than a cause for the war. Um, so, um, yeah, I guess that's, um, so, so in, in this respect, um, again, with, with respect to the framers desire to prevent the concentration of power and preserve self-government in the states, the, the federalists were of one mind with the revolutionists and with the anti-federalists. All of them, the revolutionists of 1776 and the federalists and anti-federalists of the 1780s, they all believed in self-government in the states. They all feared the concentration of power in the central government. Okay? And that's why the Federalists didn't have serious problems with adding a Bill of Rights. Okay? They did not envision a federal government that would be able to do any of those things that the Bill of Rights prohibits. Where the Federalists differed from the 1776 revolutionists and with the anti-Federalists is that they believed that their clever mechanisms could prevent the natural progress of things. You know, that they could be so clever and, and, and find ways to prevent with parchment barriers and the, in turn the uh, separation of powers, to prevent this fledgling central government from accumulating powers, expanding its jurisdictions and curtailing self-government in the states. Okay. Uh, but then, Hamiltonians started populating this newly formed federal government. And at that point, Madison and other Jeffersonians recognized that, uh, that their clever mechanisms had some shortcomings. Okay. Um, so, okay, so that's. Uh, Time, time is short, so I'm kind of skipping some questions. Uh, okay, this is, uh, so uh, there's a question here about can I, can I explain the, Ma the, Madison, the Madison problem? Um, so the Madison problem is, uh, and, and we'll end with this because enough is enough. Uh, I'm sure you all have places to go or go to bed. Um, so at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia and during the ratification contest, Madison was a leader and ally of the most strident Federalists, those Hamiltonians that historians refer to as the Nationalists. These are champions of a very strong central government. 
but uh, and, and you know he wound up compromising with uh, more moderate uh, federalists in the Philadelphia Convention and then with anti-federalists in the ratification contest. Um, but then later on during Washington's presidency, we see Madison taking a 180 degree turn and becoming the leading figure in the Jeffersonian camp that opposed Hamilton, championed states, states' rights, and railed against the aggrandizement of federal power, of federal government. And so historians have been trying to solve this puzzle ever since. You know, how could he have been with the centralizers in, um, in 1787 and 88, and then be a states' rights man uh, soon after, in the 1790s? So some historians point to Madison's personal relationship with Jefferson. You know, that because of Virginia politics, uh, he was bound to side with Jefferson and you know, that, that his heart was still with Hamilton, but political realities and personal relationships, familiar relationships, forced him to, to represent the Jeffersonian side. Other explain, uh, explain it as Virgi uh, that, that as Virginia's representative in Congress, Madison came to better understand and appreciate the interests, concerns, and fears of his Virginian constituents vis-a-vis -vis the central government. Okay, so it's, so it's the office that he held as a representative of, of uh, Virginia voters that made him uh, change his views in a relatively short time. Uh, I think a simpler explanation is that when the federal government was only a theoretical construct, so, so, so those are, I think, the two leading explanations. Um, I'm skeptical of the first and somewhat skeptical of the second. Uh, I think it's much easier to explain um, to, to explain it as, as, a, as, as a factor of the constitution transforming from a theoretical government to a real government populated by real people. So, um, so when the federal government was only a theoretical construct of Madison's imagination in 1787 and 88, he had faith that his clever safeguards, you know, those guardrails I told you about, would prevent this government from being a source of danger to American citizens. It would represent the citizens' interests rather than threaten the citizens. But after Washington's inauguration, when Hamiltonians started to actually use the machinery of government created by the Constitution, Perhaps Madison's eyes were opened to the logic of those anti-federalist uh, skeptics who had insisted on a Bill of Rights and warned that centralization is a slippery slope that gets more slippery and more sloped with time. Okay, so it might, be, uh, it might be the case that Madison discovered, as young people sometimes do, that their elders might actually understand a thing or, or a thing or two. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your uh, for your time and your questions. And if you have any other questions, you have my email. So um, please uh, contact me. Thanks. Good night.